Good morning. It's good to see all of you. My name is Keith. Julie and I are part of the Grand Lakes Community Group under the loving shepherding leadership of Eric and Teresa Anderson. And I always mention, or pretty much always mention, the fact that we're part of a community group and which one, because it's a very important part of our church's strategy for ministry, uh, not just through us, but in us. Uh, But it's especially relevant today for reasons you'll see in a moment. You know, the Word of God tells us in James that when we look at the Word, it ought to be like a mirror. We ought to see something in ourselves that uh, maybe we hadn't noticed before, or maybe we noticed before, but we're trying to forget. Uh, As I looked at the passage today, preparing for this, uh, I had real doubts about the Keith I saw. Um, You know, the, the thing we're talking about today is a struggle for me. So the Keith I saw in the mirror was either the perfect guy to talk about this passage today or the last person you need to hear from and I need to be sitting next to you in the seats taking notes. But here I am. The good news is that because I actually had to prepare this, I got to spend more time in the passage than I would if I was just listening. So I needed the extra time. Uh, I've heard people say that uh, up north in the winter when a winter storm blows in, Uh, cattle will often run away from the storm. They'll move away from it, try to stay ahead of it. And in the process, they can get separated from one another and they just keep moving away from the storm until often they end up trapped against a fence line. Uh, You know, I hear about that and I kind of understand how they feel. Uh, You know, a crisis comes into life, something you didn't see coming. You're just trying to do life. And okay, now this, great. And you try to stay ahead of it. You try to keep moving and you don't notice right away that you've lost touch with your people and you're kind of isolated and you end up all alone, pinned against the barbed wire with the snow drift over you, wondering what happened. Uh, and at those times, you know, we wonder, uh, okay, where was God in this? And how was this supposed to work? And what it, did I miss an exit? Or you, you wonder about those things. But, you know, sometimes the word of God takes the mystery away and says, okay, well, I'll tell you exactly how I work, God says. Uh, And this passage today is one of those times where God lays it out. He says, okay, here's the way I operate. It's really not very complicated. You can align with that, and things will go well, or you can stay misaligned with that, and it'll be tough, but here it is. And so that's what we're going to see today, Uh, what these things look like from God's point of view and how we can be aligned with him. I'm calling this lesson, uh, Stay Humble, Stand Strong. And we're at the very end of 1 Peter. And it seems sort of like these could be two separate topics, but they're really so strongly connected with each other that it really needs to be one idea that we look at together. Stay humble and stand strong. So we are in 1 Peter chapter 5. It was three weeks ago that AK took us through the first few verses of chapter 5, And verse five that we start with today begins with likewise. Okay, well, that means we have to look back and say, now, what did he say three weeks ago? Uh, So just thinking back to 1 Peter chapter five, verses one through three, Peter is speaking to elders, to shepherds of the flock. And not just to them, I think, but also to the people that have been delegated by them, shepherding responsibilities. So in our context, it would be elders and pastors and community group leaders and all of these wonderful people who have a responsibility for the rest of us uh, to look out for us and to care for us and to pray for us and to be a sort of a hub of community. So he's talking to those people. And he says this to them. So I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Now, if we'd read all the words, he would have talked about, uh, you know, don't do it for this kind of gain or don't, you know, like it says here, don't domineer over people. It's a humble posture they adopt that it's, they've been called by God to shepherd the rest of us and, and he's encouraging them to do that and how to do that. And it's really good and important. Now it gets to us in verse five. And he says, likewise, and this is verse five, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. We'll stop there. You who are younger. Well, I'm, I'm not younger than a lot of people. <laughs> but, you know, at one point in the early church, it, you know, if you were one of the elders, you're probably older. And, and then you, if you were not, you might be younger. But the issue here isn't age. 
the issue here is the position the calling God has for the individuals. And one of the things he's called me to do is to place myself under the authority, under the shepherding guidance of the people that he has placed over me. Uh, whether they are even younger than me, like Joel, he's, he's one of my pastors. And you know, I love that and I respect that and I value that and I honor him because of that. And despite the age difference, I mean, it's not all about age. And even Eric and Teresa, the head of our community group, they, they're also younger than we are. But, but I am called to have a certain attitude toward these people that God has put over me to, to shepherd me. And it's one of respect, it's one of submission uh, to be subject to them. But he goes on to then say, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Because humility was really key to what he has just said in verses one through three to the shepherds, that they need to do this not because of their own ego or because it makes them the big shots or, or, or to, for selfish gain. No, no, they need to do what they do out of a loving concern for the rest of us because we need them to. And it's, it's, there's humility all around, and that's the point here is that they behave in humility toward us by shepherding us. We behave in humility toward them by submitting to that shepherding. And what he's telling you here, what God's telling you here, is how he works. He's telling us that he provides loving care for his people through the shepherds that he's put over us. This is how he works. Now, you might say, yeah, but have you met them? I, and you, you know what? the shepherds that God has placed over us aren't perfect. But I don't think there were any perfect options. He's not saying these are the spiritual giants in our midst. No, he's saying these are the shepherds I've placed over you. And he is saying to us, I will use them. That's the way he wants to operate. So the point is this, God is offering us care and cover. Accept them. God is saying, this is how I will care for you. This is how I will provide spiritual cover, spiritual protection for you. God is saying, this is how I will do it. Accept them. Accept that care and cover. Because God's telling you, this is how he provides them. And so you can say, why should I be subject to the elders? Well, it's because this is how God wants to care for and protect me. That's the plan. So am I going to set myself up on the receiving end of that? Or am I going to pass on that? He goes on, second part of verse five. He says this, for, here's the reason for what he's just said, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He's quoting here Proverbs 3.34 in the Greek version that they used, the Septuagint at the time, it was worded just this way. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is the reason that we should be subject to the shepherds that God has put over us because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, let's start at the end there. He gives grace to the humble. So if I am humble and I submit to this and, and I, I place myself under that care and concern and protection, God's gonna give me grace. Awesome. But notice the other part. It's kind of crazy. God opposes the proud. Opposes. You mean... Well, surely this means that I'm just on my own, right? God says, no, no. I'm not just going to let you be on your own. I will oppose you. Wow. Maybe he could just leave me alone? <laughs> no, he can't leave me alone. See, he cares way too much about me to leave me alone. And so he basically says, listen, I've got this system I want to use to bless you and to take care of you. And if you opt out of it, I'm coming after you until you opt in. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's the system. And so what he's saying here is that God is offering to oppose you or to give you grace. Choose grace. Pro tip. I mean, those are your options. Neutral is not an option. He doesn't give you that. He's going to oppose you or he's going to give you grace. Choose grace. So God is telling us how he works. If I'm proud, he will oppose me. And if I'm humble, he will give me grace. Later on in the passage, he'll tell us a little bit about what all these look like in detail. But for now, that's the choice. Choose grace. All right, reading on. Verse six. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. 
casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Famous verse, that second one. Uh, Now he's telling us what to do. In light of this, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may exalt you in due time. Now the thing about exalt you, uh, the way ESV translates it, exalt you, it kind of sounds like it stands in contrast to humble yourselves. Like, okay, right now, they're the spiritual big dogs. You're not. So humble yourself now, and eventually God will exalt you, and what? You get to be a pastor or elder? I mean, that's not what this is saying. What it's saying is, God will in due time lift you up because the situation you're in has gotten you beat down, and you're feeling it, and you, you need help. And God says, this is how I will lift you up. This is how I'm gonna get you back on your feet. In due time, and by the way, what that means is the challenge won't always disappear immediately, but if you want the blessing now, here's how he's gonna do it. So humble yourselves, therefore. And notice then, he says in verse seven, how you do that, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. This casting of your cares is how you humble yourself. What does it mean? to humble yourself before God under his mighty hand. Well, here's what it means. It means casting all your cares on him. And why would you do that? Because he cares. He's crazy about you, apparently. That's what it looks like. So what this means is God is offering to carry your load. Let him. Humble yourselves and let him. See, arrogance says to God, pride says to God, no, no, I got this, I'm I'm good, I'm fine. Arrogance says to your fellow Christians, "Uh, nothing, because you reckon you don't need them and you don't include them and they don't know your story, they're not walking with you on your journey because you're all alone and that's pride and that's arrogance and that's the I got this attitude and God says, I'm not gonna let you get away with that. I'm gonna oppose that. I'm not gonna let it work for you because I care about you too much. That's what arrogance does. But humility says, you, you, you want to carry my load? Yes, thank you. And the result of that is peace. The offer is so simple. And God says, I'm just telling you, this is how I work. And notice, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. There's that reassurance. He can handle this. He can handle this. Will you let him? Now, what does that casting your cares look like? I had an interesting conversation between the services about this with someone. Well, it looks like a lot of different things at different times for different people. I mean, sometimes the simple thing might be that you share the anxiety that you feel with the people around you and they can pray for you. Sometimes you share that anxiety and they tell you the stories. I mentioned a moment ago about Eric and Teresa and our entire community group. They knew, they've known for two weeks the anxiety I felt about this sermon because I struggle in this area. And so it's no surprise to them because I've been sharing this with them. They know this. Eric and Teresa were in the first service. Now, if that had been the first time Eric and Teresa ever heard about my concern over this passage and me preaching this sermon, then that'd be messed up. But it wasn't the first time. We've been praying about this for two weeks. So see, that's, that's one thing that casting all your cares upon him looks like. It, it might mean leaning into community and, and letting people know you and walk with you and care about you and pray for you, letting them tell you their stories about how God gave them victory over them, be inspired by their stories. You heard me quote my mom before. Uh, some people can learn in the classroom. Others have to go on field trips. Well, you know, hearing other people's stories, learning in the classroom, learning from their field trips. Or maybe casting your cares on him means that bold step of faith. Do it. You know what he's asking you to do. Do it. I mean, it can mean different things for different people at different times. But what it all boils down to is that recognition, am I going to believe that God's got this or not? And am I going to act on it? And it often happens in community. Sometimes it's you stepping forward in bold faith in God. It looks different ways at different times. But God is offering to carry your load. Let him. So that's the humility piece, to stay humble. God is offering you care and cover. Accept them. Why wouldn't you? God is offering to oppose you or give you grace. Uh, Choose grace. 
And God is offering to carry your load. Let him. And now he says this in verse eight, because the stay humble, stand strong pieces are closely connected. Verse eight, be sober minded. He says, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Whoa. Wow. Where'd that come from? You know, it's interesting. James also quotes Proverbs 3.34, and he makes this very same point. There's something about Proverbs 3.34 that has Peter and James both thinking about this issue of the spiritual risk that you're in and the peril of pride and the vulnerability that there's something that's going on here. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. See, here's the problem. And I see this all the time in my work in marketplace ministry. It's, um, you, you do church, maybe you go to community group, and then you return tomorrow morning to your regularly scheduled life. And you're just doing the same life everybody else is doing. And you, know, you check your Christianity at the door. Maybe you bring in your ethics and morals and your heart, but it's not really central anymore. I mean, that's, that's over there. Now, today, you're over here. And so you're occupying this parallel universe, Monday through Friday. And what you don't recognize is that the enemy's got you because you've stepped away from the herd, the protection of the group. You're facing challenges you're not sharing with your people. They don't know to pray about it, so they're not. And you've so compartmentalized your life that you've got this whole big part of your life that's outside the protection that he's talking about here. And the way it usually shows up is when I talk to people about this and we, and I invite people into these kind of relationships and you know, the answer I get is, I don't have time. You don't have time. You don't have time for this. No time. What's he telling us? He's saying this, pay attention, wake up. You're being stalked by the enemy. Be sober-minded, be watchful, a little bit soft. What it's actually saying is, pay attention, wake up. Because you're walking out here in this stupor in this whole big part of the world and you've wandered away from the herd and you don't have the protection and you're not seeing the spiritual frame of reference on this thing and you're not engaging the spiritual battles and you are vulnerable. Wake up. Because the enemy is just out. You know, the enemy never charges right into the middle of the herd. He sits out on the periphery and looks for stragglers. And then once the stragglers alone, goes after him. You see, humility is strength. Pride is weakness. Why is humility strength? Well, it's because you have the protection of the herd. It's because God gives grace to the humble. It's because you're there with your people and you're known and you're prayed for and you're connected and you're strong. Humility is strength. But pride, pride's weakness. Because you think, no, I've got this. I've got that. You know, that's over there. I'm over here, not right now. And you're alone. And not only are you vulnerable, but God says, I'm going to oppose you. I'm not going to let that work. Humility is strength. Pride is weakness, and weakness invites attack. So, verse 9. Resist him. Who? The devil. Resist the devil. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Resist him. Resist the enemy. Armor up, wield your faith, stand with the brotherhood. Now, the armor up piece I'm getting from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. You know the passage. But wielding your faith, that's right here, firm in your faith. And then the the brotherhood, you're not alone. Stand firm with that brotherhood. And that's the challenge. I mean, that's where the strength is. That's the ability to resist. And then verse 10, here's the promise. 
After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The encouragement's to hang on. Deliverance is coming. And not just out in the future, because these words, they're wonderful, these four words. Um, you know, he says God gives grace to the humble. Well, what does that look like? You know, we've, we were told that he will lift you up. Okay, well, how? Here's how. These words. Uh, first of all, he will prepare you. Imagine the storm hit. You didn't even know it was coming, but God knew. And it comes, and you're dis you discover you're ready. I remember a time, it was, it was my brother-in-law, and uh, I hadn't planned to share this, but just before the birth of their first child, he said, he said, Keith, I don't know why it is, but I just really feel God's presence. I just feel his strength. And he said, I'm not praying more or studying the Bible more. I just, I mean, he's so real to me right now. It's amazing. And then their child was born, and the doctors didn't think the child would make it through the day. I will never forget the words of Dr. Argyle at Texas Children's Hospital when she said, I was there with my brother-in-law. They had transported the baby over. My sister was still at the other hospital. When the doctor said to my brother-in-law, your little boy is the sickest little baby at Texas Children's Hospital. And he didn't quite live a year, but... Um, Notice what happened there is God strengthened him and prepared him in advance. You know, people say Christianity is a crutch. Well, that's good because I need a crutch. But how do you explain the crutch coming in advance? There's only one way to explain that. God knows and he prepares us. And see, that's what it looks like for God to lift you up. It doesn't mean that the problem's going to vanish and that the challenge is going to go away. It means that when it comes, you're prepared. And then he says that he's going to support you. So the storm hits and you're prepared. And as it carries on, you, you find I'm staying stronger than I got any right to be. You feel his support. You feel his presence and you feel it spiritually and you feel it through your people, the people that are there with you, your community, because you're not alone. And then he strengthens you. You get stronger through the battle. And he establishes you. You stand firm. This is what he's promising. And eventually, he says he's called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Yes, eventually, there will be full victory. But in the meantime, this is what it looks like for God to give grace to the humble and to lift you up. And it sounds awesome to me. So that's the offer. And then he reminds us in verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The enemy is no match for this. No match. So hang on. Deliverance is coming. Full deliverance when we are with him. But real meaningful deliverance right now unless you decide to go proud and then you miss all of this. You know, I was mentioning earlier about the cattle. There's another story that we talk about a lot in this ministry I'm part of. Um, and it's about buffalo. Buffalo are different because when the winter storm hits, buffalo gather up in the herd for the protection of the herd because they need each other. And then they run straight into the storm. Well, why do they do that? Because you get through it faster. If you run away from the storm, it's following you. If you turn together and run right into it, you have the protection of the herd and you get through it faster. And that's what we're called to be for each other. We call it buffalo culture, but that, that's what we're called to be. You've got the herd, and we protect one another, and we're there for each other, and we strengthen each other. Not stragglers out here that the enemy's going to take down, 
but the herd that's strong. I, you know, mount, I don't know, I guess a mountain lion could probably take down a straggling, weak buffalo, but I don't think you see many mountain lions attacking the herd. So that's what we're supposed to be for each other, a herd that we gather up, we're protecting each other, we're there for each other, and together we run straight at the enemy. And the result is victory. So in verse 12, Peter wraps it up. By Salvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. God is saying, this is how I work. This is how I work. Stay humble. Stand strong. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your care for us. And that we can cast all our anxieties on you because you care. And Lord, I thank you that we have the joy and privilege of caring for each other of being agents of your love. But Lord, I think all of us feel the, uh, the pull toward pride and isolation and hiding hurts and not being open about the struggles and we end up attacked by the enemy. Lord, I pray that we would be a, a humble, loving family where each one of us feels free to just be open about, yeah, this is killing me. I'm really struggling. I, I need help here. Thank you. And, and so that we can be there for each other as part of that herd. And I pray that as a result of that humility that you would pour out your grace in just the way you described, preparing us and, and strengthening us, supporting us, establishing us. And Father, I pray that together we would take on the enemy rather than becoming victims, that we'd be victors. Father, thank you for this wonderful book. And we look forward to 2 Peter coming right up. But Lord, let us be the kind of people we describe here. In Christ's name we pray.